Rural Heritage on RFD-TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi-monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small-scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319-362-3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. As industrial food production becomes more focused on delivery speed and product conformity, families are being offered fewer choices at the supermarket for wholesome and nutritious fresh foods. Responding to this trend, more people are supporting local CSAs and farmers markets where they can find vegetables and fruits grown locally. Many of these local growers are planting heritage or heirloom varieties of seeds so they can offer their customers flavors, textures, and colors they can't find in the supermarket. In addition, home gardening, which had been declining for years, has begun to come back and these amateur gardeners are looking for alternatives to the hybridized offerings from the major seed companies. In the Ozarks of Missouri, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds ships over 150,000 orders throughout the world, offering varieties of seeds that have been saved for generations and are now finding new life among a public weary of industrial food production. When I was a small child growing up in the Boise Valley um, in the early 80s, um, as well I re where I really uh, you know, took an interest in gardening. Both my parents were gardeners and then um, both, my, both my grandmothers on my dad and mom's side and also my great-grandmother who lived in the area as well gardened as well as all my aunts and uncles. So I took a natural interest to gardening. It was the first thing that I really, uh, really the first thing I really remember in life, the first thing I noticed was being out in the garden and the flowers and the vegetables and the birds and grasshoppers and it was just an amazing experience as a two and three year old. Uh, my earliest memories are out there. And the first thing that I planted, I remember, was the yellow pear tomato and the scallop squash. I can still remember growing those and uh, standing out by the scallop squash and they were about as tall as I was. And it was just an amazing experience to put that seed in and come back about 45, 50 days later and have little scallop squash coming. And um, that's kind of what I guess really got me interested in diversity all the diversity in the seeds and being in Boise Valley the climate is great for growing you know pretty much every type of vegetable it's kind of like California at least in the summer so we put in big gardens and uh, my fondest memories as a child is looking through old seed catalogs and you know dreaming one day maybe I could work for a seed company or be part of a seed company somehow and be able to work with seeds and gardening and trial and test things that was kind of always my interest. We, we gardened in uh, Boise Valley for a number of years and um, but only until I was five. My parents were there before but you, and my grandparents but then when I was five they moved to Montana and we had a, a large root cellar and uh, we put away tons of our root vegetables, potatoes, it was great potato country, squash, you know cabbage as well as all sorts of canned goods and other root vegetables like turnips but even you know before we moved to Montana my parents were canning everything in 1993, when I was about 12, almost 13 years old, my uh, family decided to up and move uh, to Missouri. We were, my folks, I think, wanted a little warmer climate, although some years it isn't a, a lot warmer here in the Missouri Ozarks than Montana, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. But anyway, uh, we, my folks packed up and we moved down here and looked for a place, and we found this, uh, my folks found this farm here on the Gasconade River here in um, south, uh, kind of central Missouri. And I've been here for 21 years now. I've been gardening here. Yes, I first started traveling to um, Mexico and um, Thailand shortly thereafter when I was in my early 20s, 21, 22, 23, 24. In that era, I was traveling a couple times a year, you know, usually once to Mexico and once to uh, Thailand for several years. And, um, and also I went down to Guatemala and Belize once and then also to Cambodia a couple times when I was over in Asia and so forth. But um, I it really, I, I loved, always loved traveling and seeing places and uh, looking for plants and meeting different cultures. And it, it's something I, you know, want to do more and more. Time-wise, it's always, uh, it feels like I can't, you know, when you're on a farm and you're doing gardening and farming plus seeds uh, with the seed company, it's always never enough time. But we have, fortunately, every so often, like last year, we were able to get away for uh, about two months to uh, Thailand and Europe and uh, travel around and 
go to ancient Roman sites and find little wild, semi-wild plants, which were, I'm sure at one time were cultivated, or go up into the hill tribes and, you know, uh, have a hill tribe family give you a variety of vegetables that they say, uh, you know, the reason they're planting it, the variety of squash they gave us, even though it isn't really uniform, they say the reason they're planting it is they don't have to use any uh, commercial uh, insecticides on it. They say it's resistant to insects. And that's the kind of stuff we're looking for. It's great tasting. It might not be uniform, but it has the it, insect resistance. And that's really important for especially people looking to do organic or even people that just want to use less pesticides or have an easier garden where you don't have to take care of it so much. A lot of the old varieties are actually much easier than uh, commercial hybrids that are easy only if you care for them in certain climates and also oftentimes have certain requirements as far as um, how they're treated. Whereas a lot of these old varieties might not be uniform, might not have a big market, but for a home gardener or a homesteader, they're amazing. Or even somebody that's selling to restaurants or chefs, they're perfect for those kind of uses. They're just not shipping varieties. For almost 40 years, Rural Heritage Magazine has helped readers borrow from yesterday to do the work of today. The magazine is packed with stories and information about farming and logging with draft animal power, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. If you or someone you know wants to run a self-sufficient, diversified family farm, or just learn how to make a weekend hobby farm more productive, Rural Heritage Magazine is a smart choice. Articles cover a wide range of interesting and useful topics and are written by people living on the land doing the work they write about. A one-year subscription is $34.95 for six issues, 24% off the newsstand price. Sign up for two years and save even more. Order online at www.ruralheritage.com or by calling 319-362-3027. That's www.ruralheritage.com or 319-362-3027. I started uh, putting in a garden as soon as we got here in 93. And then in 94 is when I really took off because I had a full summer to garden that year. And I started planting every kind of tomato I could you know, gather. And in, within a year or so, I joined Seed Savers Exchange and started trading seeds with different members. The internet was starting to come out in the middle or so 90s. and. Uh, writing different seed savers both here in the U.S. and seed collectors um, in the U.S. and you know Australia and uh, a seed collector from Iraq and so forth. So we started to uh, getting more and more kinds of seeds in the garden. I started saving seeds and I, I always had the dream of somehow you know being able to make it a living, make an income out of seeds and being able to uh, do a you know home-based business with you know gardening and seeds. So in 1998 I sent out a little 12 page price list to about 550 people. It didn't really make any money and maybe basically barely broke even. And so I kind of wondered how, um, how it was gonna make a living for me, but I wanted to press on even if it was just a hobby. And the next year was 1999 and a lot of people were concerned about Y2K and our seed sales went up about 40 times. And it took over the whole upstairs. It was in my bedroom originally and it took over the whole upstairs of our house. And uh, then in 2000, it was, I was I was a little concerned again whether the sales would drop off after the you know the first of the year, but uh, they held on and I had about the same year again. And then after that, each year got busier from then until now. And right now we're sending out about 150, 160,000 orders a year and about 440,000 catalogs each year. Each year has grown. 2008 and 2009 were our biggest growth years, which made it the difficult, most difficult on us. We grew about 100 percent two years in a row. So all of a sudden the space we had that was more than enough within a month into the season, we realized it was, you know, half the size we needed. And so we added on but and condensed and, you know, modified space. And then the next year was the same way again. We had a little more, uh, we had a little more insight that it might be busy because of the previous year. So we were a little better shape, but even then we still weren't ready because um, in the first six years since me and my wife, uh, Emily had gotten married, the business grew 10 times. So it was at 10 times the growth that it was in uh, 96 to I think 2012. So it was uh, a, a lot of growth and unfortunately for us, we were not able to travel a whole lot in that time period. So we're finally kind of uh, plateauing enough now and getting our systems in place that makes it a little easier to uh, you know, actually do more gardening and more traveling and other things besides just packing seeds and shipping orders.
And uh, we've always done a little of it, but it, you know, it, it limits what you can, uh, how many trips you can take and how many, uh, just how much gardening you can do. Now we're able to really start expanding again. We were kind of set in our space, you know, we're set on a couple acres and that's all we could get in because of, uh, you know, being understaffed for years. So we're finally getting to the point where we can, uh, you know, really do a lot of trialing. This year we're trialing several thousand varieties. So it's, uh, that's the part that I really enjoy besides, uh, you know, besides finding the seeds, it's the trialing and, and not just vegetables, everything. I mean, anything from tulips to, uh, raspberries to, you know, of course, eggplants and tomatoes and peppers and all the, and every kind of rare uh, and different species of vegetables. It's all fascinating. There's so much out there that uh, that's what keeps us excited. Our vegetable seeds, we grow a portion of them here, about 100 varieties, around 100 varieties a year, but the bulk of our seeds, uh, the 16, 1700 varieties in the catalog actually come from a, a network of small farmers and uh, large home gardeners actually in the range of about 150 to 175, scattered across the U.S. mostly and two or three in other countries as well, as well as a small network of a dozen or so small seed saving uh, organizations and, and seed growers that actually do it full time. But most of our farmers that grow for us, it's a side income. There might be one or two that they do seed saving pretty much as their major part of their income, but the vast majority of them are growing, you know, a couple tomatoes and a couple squash as a either a side income on their farm or just because it's their passion to uh, save seed. But then there are, are about maybe a dozen to maybe even 20 uh, small seed organizations and companies we work with as well that um, produce um, open pollinated heirloom uh, type seeds, both for us and oftentimes for other companies as well or for even you know large farmers. So. There's a lot of terms out there and heirloom uh, and there's heirloom and heritage and basically heritage is used more in Europe it's like in, in Canada to an extent as well and heirloom took off in the US and kind of eclipsed the word heritage which had been used kind of on and off as well but basically it, the terms mean sort of all the same and you know and, and some terms like antique have been applied to roses and apples so oftentimes those are called, they can be called heirloom or they can be called antique. And all these terms are just terms to basically describe a vegetable as an old vegetable. As far as the exact age or so forth, it means different things to different people. And it also kind of depending on your age, if you're 75, a 40 year old variety might not seem that old. But if you're say nine years old, variety 15 years old seems ancient. So, you know, into different perspectives, the terms, basically an heirloom variety though means, you know, it's a variety that can be saved and passed down generation after generation. It's open pollinated, which means uh, basically it's, uh, you know, again, another term that has multiple meanings, but basically a term that means that it stays true year after year and that it's pollinated naturally in the field and not pollinated by, you know, a man or a machine that's hybrid, that went as in hybridization, where oftentimes it's, pollinated by a machine or a person and also controlled afterwards. So each, you know, it's control, each generation is uh, bred individually and controlled each year. So, uh, and, uh, and it's not GMO, you know, unfortunately some GMOs have crossed into some of the older varieties, especially in corn, which is something we work to uh, maintain purity and do testing to make sure that that is hopefully not an issue in our seed. There's lots of different terms and uh, there's basically, you know, heirloom, open pollinated, non-hybrid on one side, and then there's hybrid on the other side and GMO, which are not hybrid. Again, genetically, GMO or genetically modified organism are varieties that can be hybrid or they don't necessarily have to be hybrid. They're just varieties that have genes inserted from another plant, animal, uh, pretty much any other species. And then there's hybrids, which is basically just a cross between two different varieties which generally won't uh, stay true if you save seed from it. And then there's the open pollinated, non-hybrid, heritage, antique, so forth. Basically, all, all, what all seeds used to be pretty much were, you know, if you ordered from a catalog where seeds you could save seeds from, they didn't have any patents or hybridization as far as uh, what the home gardener would notice. You know, it's nothing that they couldn't save seed from. So it's really just the last 50, 60 years when uh, all these terms even became meaningful. Before that, all seeds were just seeds and they could be passed down and traded just like uh, they were created to be. You know, it was something that uh, they were in the hands of the people to do with whatever you wanted with. And that's what, you know, we strive to only offer varieties that are 
available for you know seed saving. We don't offer any varieties with U.S. patents on them. So uh, if a if a homeowner in the U.S. wants to save seed, they can do with whatever they want. I mean, they can sell it, they can keep it, they can crossbreed it, whatever they prefer. So, yeah, in general, the you know the open pollinated non hybrid varieties, uh, you know, somewhat like the hybrid varieties are also selected and developed, you know, actually oftentimes over many, many generations. There are some exceptions to that to uh, like, uh, you know, wild and uh, kind of somewhat traditional crops that are just basically gathered or, you know, maybe gathered and occasionally planted. But um, most of them, like uh, say the Brandywine tomato or the Cherokee purple, most of these varieties have been selected over the years for the best fruit, the tastiest fruit. And that's why we've got such, you know, great varieties in general. Um, you know, but unlike the hybrid varieties, you don't have to go back and make a cross every generation in order to get that seed. You're able to, uh, you know, keep planting the seed and improving it in your home garden. That's the, the other main advantage. Um, if you plant a hybrid variety, you can't improve it at all. I mean, whatever you get from the seed company, you have to get again next year. Um, with the open pollinated varieties, if you save the variety for 20 years and you select the biggest seed for 20 years, most likely you're going to have a bigger tomato. If you select the smallest seed for 20 years, the smallest fruits rather, right. you're most likely going to have a smaller fruited tomato. If you select one with disease resistance, there's a good chance you'll build up disease resistance. So it's actually much more uh, you know, sustainable for a small farmer. It also takes more work. It takes more dedication to uh, you know, seed saving and paying diligence to what's growing on your farm and how it's growing. But in the long run, you're going to have, if you're interested in a self-sustaining farm, it's much better off to uh, do it the traditional way, the way it's always been done, except in, uh, you know, the, since the modern uh, thought of uh, packaged food came about, that's really when it changed, you know, how we thought about it. What we do here at the Baker Creek, it's definitely, we, we're involved with seeds as the core of our operation, and we got to keep that the core at all times. But uh, we also have so many other interests, and uh, both me and my wife, uh, we are, have always been interested in history and the story of our food and, uh, and you know, old, old farms and places and barns and uh, the history of, uh, you know, whether it's poultry or uh, livestock, you know, even if we're not doing it all ourselves, the story behind it or blacksmithing, it's all fascinating. And here at our farm here in Missouri, we've kind of put together a little historic farm and village trying to showcase people. Um, to people, you know, other old time uh, parts, uh, you know, what happened in uh, traditional times, how we, they might have blacksmithed or made candles. And that's one of the reasons we started festivals about 14 years ago. Um, that I actually started that about um, right after I started the seed company. Um, within a, about two years, we started doing the festivals and uh, people love coming out and hearing music, learning about uh, whether it's uh, how to make uh, soap or candles or learning gardening techniques and beekeeping and uh, raising crops or raising different animals or uh, you know also learning about what's happening with our food supply, learning how to cook different recipes. People, we were trying to become more and more you know an educational site as well as not just a seed company that we're here just for uh, selling seeds. We want to educate people about how to grow them and how to you know save their own seed as well as you know, other surrounding aspects, we invite uh, different people to come and uh, at our monthly festivals and uh, join us as far as uh, whether they play music or whether they do traditional crafts or carving or we're, we want to encourage all the different traditional arts here at our festivals in particular. That's when we really uh, have a lot going on as far as the, you know, arts and crafts and other related food, food preservation and so forth. First Sunday of every month and then we have a big two day festival in May. And it's uh, the first Sunday and Monday in May, but then the rest are Sunday through uh, March through October. Oftentimes they're telling us stories about the variety of the hybrid squash on the table. They're telling us, you know, what, how they remember their great grandmother cooking it, or they remember, you know, a Native American man giving them a handful of seeds of this or that, or they remember this variety, their grandfather passed it to them and told them it was grown before the Civil War, or all these old stories. We love hearing the stories as well as sharing our stories with the people walking by because oftentimes people don't have any story and it's totally new to them as well. So it's interesting, you know, connecting with the people both here at the farm and when we're out and about or wherever we're at though, the interest, it doesn't even seem to be, um, 
you know, just in agricultural groups anymore, wherever you're at. Um, it seems like people are, even people that don't garden are all of a sudden interested in the story of their food. And many of them want to do a little gardening of some sort. Almost everybody that you talk to at least wants to do something now. And the schools that have put in salad bars and so forth I didn't think that, um, you know, the kids would eat salad. And now oftentimes um, this, the, the question is the schools are concerned about, they put, when they put them in, they weren't concerned. And now they're concerned about the economics because it's so much cheaper to buy something that's stuffed with fats and sugars because all of those things are subsidized and that spinach or uh, radicchio or uh, lettuce is oftentimes not subsidized by the government. So it's uh, oftentimes that now they're wondering, sometimes schools are actually, you know, taking out their salad bars because they say they can't uh, pay for them just because all of the, the sugary, fattening things that are filled with corn primarily, I mean, corn is so cheap simply because it shouldn't be cheap, but it's cheap because it's, you know, subsidized and other things aren't. So basically, uh, you know, they're, they're having to eat, you know, in most cases they're eating, you know, everything they're eating is stuffed with corn. It doesn't, it, even the meats are stuffed with, they're grown on corn. So, and then they're wrapped in some more corn when they package them. And, and not saying that corn is a bad product. It's not, it's a great healthy product, but the way we're growing it and producing it, just like the way we're producing all our other food, it took a great healthy product that used to sustain people and make it into a questionable low nutrition product. In some cases, the protein level is half now of what traditional corns were. So it's, you, you know, protein wasn't hard to get. You could, at one time, uh, the corn would have all the protein you'd need. If you, all you had was corn for the winter, it had all you needed. And now it's, you know, oftentimes half of that what it used to be. So it's like, you know, people are always saying, how do I get this or how do I get that? A lot of it has just disappeared in breeding. And then the soils don't help either. You know, the soils are the other issue. But I mean, the biggest thing we've seen, I think, is more than anything, though, is just the breeding. People are breeding for mass production. And you're getting more mass, but the nutrition goes down in everything, you know, across our spectrum of food, whether it's the milk or whether it's you can't produce unlimited amounts bigger and bigger and bigger and expect it's just like a giant watermelon. Giant watermelons and giant pumpkins are fun to grow. But in general, they're not quite as good eating. A 200-pound watermelon isn't as good eating as a, uh, as a, you know, the 25-pound regular-sized watermelon. It's the same that goes to things that produce way more than they should. If a cow's producing way more milk than is healthy for the cow, your nutrition isn't going to be as good. Plus, you're going to be getting all kinds of hormones and other, you know, antibiotics and other things just to keep the cow going and living. It's, it's a, a, the, amount of, the amount of chemicals to keep up with it, the amount, everything is taking more than is natural. I mean, we used to produce food and, you know, we would, we, we might gather manure off the farm or if we weren't, even if we weren't growing manure, I mean, you'd plant cover crops. So you, you would have to take breaks and plant cover crops or, you know, scrape out the chicken house. But it, you were growing crops that weren't taking as much nutrients up as the crops are now. I mean, as far as not, I'm not, and it's in nutrients, not necessarily, some of the crops now don't take up all the nutrients, they just take up the nitrogen and a few of the main elements at huge rates, leaving out most of the other nutrients. They're just built to, just like the uh, chicken industry when they produce uh, chickens that produce full-size bodies, uh, giant bodies that can hardly walk in six to eight weeks. It's the same scenario. They're supposed to take three, four, five, six months and we're producing them in, you know, six to eight weeks. These blobs that can't walk, that are, you know, basically tortured, tortured from, you know, their whole lives and, um, you know, kept alive on chemicals and antibiotics. And then we eat all that. It, the whole, our whole food system. And, and, I, and I understand we can't change farming overnight, but I mean, it's went too far the other direction. We need to start, um, you know, taking it back little by little toward our traditional ways of doing things. How did, how did we survive before, um, you know, all this, uh, you know, modern agriculture? We survived by having a lot of small farms everywhere. I mean, the, every neighborhood had small farms. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. 
It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of Back to the Land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.